Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Shepherd's Corner. But I, 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 my name is Deacon Derek Walker. And you know we have conversations with the Archbishop. And yes, we started last week. We were talking about, you know, abortion and so on. And I know we got a lot of comments in. And today is part two. And we're dealing with rotten fruits of the same tree. Now, I don't know where Archbishop G going with this one. Rotten fruits of the same tree. But let's just go and, 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 and you know, journey and have this conversation with him. Good evening, Archbishop Charles Jason Gordon. How are you? I'm okay, Derek. But listen to me. You know, Jesus said, a good tree cannot produce bad fruit. Correct. A bad tree cannot produce good fruit. So by the fruit, you will know them. Absolutely. So if, if when you see the fruit, you realize the fruit is rotten, you know there's something wrong with the tree. Let's just start with that one. Let's now, start with that. I'm going with that. I'm going with that. We, we, we started last week on abortion, and we spoke about a number of things with regards to that and so on. And, and this week we are dealing with why, why have we been so accommodating to abortion? That's the big question. Why? You know, let's start again by recapping what we know, okay? What we know is that the fetus in the womb of the mother is a human life. We know that already. We also know that it has an independent genetic structure from mom and from dad. We know that in its natural home, the womb, if left undisturbed, it would become a baby, a toddler, a child, a teen, a young adult, and ultimately an adult. We also know that. As such, from the moment of conception, it has all the dignity and the rights of a human person. Without all the technology that we have today, Tertullian, the second century father of the church, saw very clearly. And he said, he who will one day be a man is a man already. In other words, this little fetus, this little embryo in, in the mother's womb that might look really small, it could fit in the palm of my hand. If one day it will become a man, it is a man already. And that means that if one day it will be a human being, already it is a human being and should be treated with all dignity, all respect and all the rights of a human being. I that it. is, yeah, I got it. That that's the that's the the the, the ground position. People who have seen abortions say to me that when you see that little matter taken out of uh, a woman's womb, although it stopped breathing at that stage, you could see a perfect formation you can see the perfect formation. There is no doubt what it is. And there's no doubt if left undisturbed, what it will be. What it is already and what it will be in terms of, of, of future. And I, would, I, just, I just want to add to that because you just spoke about something. And that is this little baby which could fit in the palm of your hand. Mm -hmm. So I have carved you correct in the cup in the palm of my hand. Yeah. Yes. And, and this baby has uh, everything, all the fingers, all the toes, and the ears, carved, everything. Eyes, nose, mouth, neck, everything. Everything that you could see, the baby has has all of all. And and so that's a, that's what we know. And, and we have to start, we have to start there. What, what has happened with the area of abortion is that many people, and this is a whole gender ideology, has seen abortion as women's issues. Well, you know, yes and no, because if it's only women's issues, then they have no 
the man has produced, has given nothing to it, and then has nothing to say, and no, no, neither responsibility or a say in it. So it, it because remember this life is not genetic structure of mama, is an independent genetic structure. So it's not like her liver, her spleen, or any part of her being, which is the same genetic structure of her. This, this, this being has a different genetic structure. So this is, can't be counted as just a part of her body. It's an independent life. We saw that already last week. Mm -hmm. And therefore, to say that this is uh, about the choice of a woman, we have to ask, how did we get to that? Because, you know, a woman might have four children, one in the womb and three outside the womb. And if you say it's her choice to decide what happens with her child, I know nervous for the three outside of her. Yeah. I'm nervous. So is it really about women's issues alone? Or is it really about life issues that involve all of us? All of us. And, and that's really the question that we have to, to ask ourselves. Because to say it's about women's issues is to say it only has to do with the child, with the woman as, as part of the woman's body, then she could determine what she does with it. That, that's really what, you, what you're backing down into. To understand this is about life in its most broad and, and, and generic sense is to understand that regardless of the, the woman and her experience and her will, that this entity is independent. It's, it has its house or home in the woman, but it's independent of. And that's, that's really the point I want to get at when we, we launch in, into this. You know, the, 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 you hear so many arguments on that side and they, they, they see what this, this, I want to use the word that they would use, you know, this, this, this fetus inside of me, they're not calling it a human being, this fetus, no, no, no. you know, because of this fetus, because of what, what is going on inside there, I am, I am being denied what I want to do, you know, I right. want to finish my degree, or I want to do this. Or oh, I have five children already. I don't want to have another child because how am I going to feed it? And take, yeah, so I want to get rid of this. Correct. And, and it is that, that, that thinking that I want to get at today. Because that's the thinking that we have to get at. How does that thinking come about? And how did we become so accommodating to that thinking? That, that's the question that we're addressing today. I want to look at the early witness. Huh? We didn't always think this way, you know. This thinking is about 50, 50 something years old, okay? Is that recent? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This, this is about 50 something years old. You know, today the Catholic Church is one of the very few Christian churches that has a consistent position against contraception, abortion, and sexual immorality. Wait, 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 wait. We're talking about abortion, but I see a jump into contraception and sexual morality, and you're lumping it with abortion. I'm going down the road with you. You know, sometimes you just had to get on the boat, you know. <laughs> before 60 years ago, or even before the 1930s, most Christian churches had the same consistent teaching on abortion, contraception, and sexual morality that we have today, before the 1930s. Most of the Christian churches had pretty much the same, the same teaching we have today. That change, it started changing in the 1930s, and by 50 years ago, it just kind of splintered, leaving the Catholic Church standing alone with its teaching on contraception, on abortion and on sexual immorality. That's recent, okay? So you're, you're talking about 90 years ago, we were all singing from the same song sheet. And somehow or the other, we decided to, to start singing from very, very, very different song sheets. 
So hold on to your, 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 your hat and, 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 and you know, you know just, just do a buck clap, okay? Just do a buck clap for this one because I, I have no easy way to say it and I'm going to say it as it was written. A buck cleaner. A buck cleaner. But excellent. In an earlier time, when all the major religions had the same kind of framework that we have, the, there was a thinking that was, was so similar to our thinking. But I would say that that thinking was way out there. You know? Way, way, way out there. And you're going to hear some things today and it's, it's going to seem absolutely strange to you. And that's okay. Sometimes things from ages past have to sound strange. Hear, hear, the, hear this one. John Calvin in the 1500s said, birth control is murder of a future person. Wait, this is John Calvin you're telling me? John Calvin, the Protestant reformer. Yeah, of course I know who he is. Protestant reformer uh -huh. said that birth control is murder of a future person. Wow. So the, 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 he likened birth control with abortion. Huh? Wow. Yeah. Yeah. That birth control is murder of a future person. I wanted to hear this. Huh? It is, this, I mean, I want to tell you, when I first came upon, upon this, I stopped and stared into space for a long time. Huh? Because what leads them to think this is what I was trying to figure out, how, how, how they came to the conclusion. We can, we can see the conclusion from where we sit now. Yeah. Because we can look backwards and say, well, you're right. Because birth control has led to abortion. Yeah. And therefore, it is murder of a future person, directly and indirectly. So we could see that. But, but the, the, the rotten tree and the same, or the rotten fruits from the same tree, I'm talking about abortion and contraception, and that these two are together. You, you can't separate the two. One brings about the other one. Now, you're going to have a lot of people, got a lot of people, you know, they're already saying how two men could be talking about, 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 about this abortion thing, eh? But thank God you're a married man. <laughs> <laughs> thank God you're a married man. <laughs> thank God. So John Calvin says, birth control is murder of a future person. Okay, just, just, just suck that one up. Right. But it gets worse or better, depending on your perspective. John Wesley, lived in the, in the 1700s, said taking, taking preventative measures was unnatural and would destroy the soul of those who practice it. Wow. This John Taking Wesley. Preventative measures yeah. was unnatural and would destroy the soul of those who practice it. Wesley is, is another big reform thinker, yeah. okay? Yeah. Mm -hmm. A really big reform thinker. So, and he's saying the taking preventative meds, med measures, in other words, using artificial contraception, it was unnatural and it would destroy the soul of those who practice it. How they come to this conclusion, wow. we'll, we'll look at in a little while, but this is, this is the conclusion that they've come to. Now, this, one, this next one, I want a parachute, an airbag, and, and uh, uh, a buckle, okay? A warning here. A, a Guinea Surgeon General, General warning on, on, on our package. So, so be warned, okay? Be warned. This one rough. This is Martin Luther, the great reformer. Are you talking the 1400s? I'm talking 1483 to 1546. Here how long ago, eh? So 1500s, 1700s, and 14, 1400s, okay? And here what Luther has to say. You buckle up? I buckle in, I buckle in. Birth control is sodomy. Wow! Birth control. This is Martin Luther, the great Martin Luther. Yeah, yeah. The, the Protestant reformer. Yes. He says that birth control is sodomy. You know, somebody will ask me, why am I quoting all of these Protestant 
reformers who broke away from the church. I'm quoting them to show that their teaching on sexual morality when it comes to birth control and abortion and sexual morality was even more on the, on the edge than our teaching is today. And I'm, I'm showing deliberately that these reformers were fundamentally against both birth control and abortion from the very, very beginning. Then something happened and then we reached to where we are. And that's what we have to look at. So my, my discipline, which is historiography, is that when there's a phenomena, you want to look at the 500 year span of it. Mm -hmm. Because the 60 to 70 year span which we are in is really foam on the wave and noise. We had to look at the, the four 500 year span to understand how we got to where we got to right now. And that's what we're looking at. Oh, you, you know, I, I, I'm picking you up here. I'm picking you up here. I'm, I'm, I, I mean, I just hear Martin Luther, sodomy. John Wesley destroys the souls of those who practice it. This is taking preventative measures, right? And we, Calvin, birth control is murder of future persons. I don't know where you're going next, but do you see those three? Those three are big, 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 big. Yeah. Next, I go into the 1930s. There was an Anglican bishop, Charles Gore. The Anglican church in the 1930s was voting to make birth control okay for married couples. Okay? And he was doing his big vote. And he had all of his big debate. And at, at, at the end of the debate, this Anglican Bishop Charles Gore warned the Anglican church against contraception, even for married couples. Hear what he says. Buckle up, eh? Accepting contraception would open the door to accepting homosexual sodomy. Wow. 1930. 1930. Bishop, Anglican Bishop Charles Gore. Accepting sodomy, accepting contraception would open the door to accepting homosexual sodomy. Now, what they were seeing, I would ask what they were drinking or smoking, but what they were seeing is certainly different from what I see from where I sit. But their, what their predictions have said, and now you're looking at 50, 60 years of birth control widely available. And you have to ask yourself, were these guys wrong? Were these guys wrong? Uh, is, the things that we're seeing now with sexual morality and sexual immorality, is it just fluke and chance? Or, or were these prof prophets who saw something of the connection with the married couple and, and their rhythm of life in giving themselves to each other that we are not seeing 60 years later because of the sexual revolution, because of contraception, because of all the other things that have come, come into, into play. That's the real question I'm asking. And I want to tell you, these statements shocked me when I came across them. Well, you know, the internet is going to explode watching the show. I just said, you know, you know, they're going to now pull us down for being two men talking about this. Eh? <laughs> I, well, I reported on what some men say. <laughs> <laughs> you realize it's a set of men be talking. Who reported on? We reported on. Yeah. It. All right, all right. Cool. Yeah. You know, let me go, go on. That, that's, the, that's the perspective of the, of the reformers of an Anglican bishop. This one, this one teeth may have even worse. This is now the perspective of the Washington Post. This, uh, this, the Washington Post is, is media, is a mainstream media. media house. Yes. Mainstream media house. Here what the Washington Post speaking about contraception says. Carried its logical conclusion, the committee's report 
on contraception and being pro-contraception, if carried into effect, would sound the death knell of marriage as a holy institution by establishing degrading practices which would encourage indiscriminate immorality. The suggestion that the use of legalized contraception would be careful and restrained is preposterous. This is secular media. And, and what you're saying is this secular Main media, stream, the committee's report, they say they had a committee that reported on this thing. And, and it's the mainstream secular media is editorializing the committee's report yes. as being which, and the committee was pro contraception for married couples. And, and what the, the, the Washington Post is saying is that even in, in, in it, if you take it as logical conclusion, a number of things, it would be the death knell of marriage as a holy institution by establishing degrading practices, which would encourage indiscriminate immorality. And then it goes further to say the suggestion that the use of legalized contraception would be careful and restrained is preposterous. Grab your children, bring your teenage children, bring those who want to get married, bring those who are living together. They've got to watch this show. Listen, I don't care what anybody says. Bring them, watch this show. We on on Thursday night. We on again on Thursday midnight. We on again on Sunday morning. We on again Sunday night. Bring the children, let them see. You watch it too. Rotten fruit, same tree, partner. Right. But this one with the media, I mean, <laughs> the, 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 the Protestant reformers, you know, I, I still are struggling with the connection between contraception and sodomy. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> but what this one kind of gives you a halfway house. Once carried this logical con conclusion, the committee's report, which is um, legalized contraception, for married couples, correct. Um, if carried into effect, would sound a death knell of marriage as a holy institution. Now, sixty years later, can we still say that marriage is a holy institution today? No way. The way it was seen 50, 60 years ago. No way. No way. Do our young people see marriage as a holy institution today, the way they saw it 50, 60 years ago? And I would this is where the problem is. Huh? Yeah. So we are we dealing with prophecy on one side. We're dealing with some prophecy on one side. Mm -hmm. and, and we're dealing with the reality. 90 years on, we're dealing with the reality of what, what was prophesied by the, by the Washington Post. That's what we're dealing with. This is what they said 90 years ago. Well, today, this is what we're dealing with. What are we dealing with? What, what does marriage look like? not a holy institution. He goes on to say, um, establishing degrading practices which would encourage indiscriminate immorality. Help me. Help you? Go to a carnival fair. Help you? <laughs> you, you, know, you know what parents telling the, the children? Make sure you have protection. Yeah. Before you leave home. You know you're going out there. Make sure... We're talking about establishing degrading practices which would encourage, encourage indiscriminate immorality because the parents telling the sons, make sure you make sure you get make sure you're working with some protection, you know. As opposed to telling the son, remember you are waiting on the bride right. that you will marry. Correct. And until you meet that person and until you get married, you wait. Rather than telling boy and girl the same story, you wait. No. So what are, the reason why I pull these quotes from yesteryear, 500 years ago and 90 years ago, is to demonstrate how different a perspective people then had from what we have today. And that's the main point I want to make. That, that how they saw it then is very different from how we see it now. And then we have to ask ourselves, how did we get to here? How did we get to here is the question.
And, and I think that the Washington Post tells us how we got here. I think John Wesley tells us how we got here. I think Martin Luther tells us how we got, got here. And so when, when the present culture has, has done its, its dissociation of gender and sex, it can do it because we have uncoupled the unitive from the pro, procreative act in sex by introducing artificial co contraception. And once that first dissociation was established as normal, everything else that flows, flows from that disconnection. Remember, I, I tell you, yeah, yeah. Up. Boy, I, do I tell it. you parachute, I tell you airbag. Eh? I think that Does was enough. Wrong? That was not yeah. enough because we, we have it in our face, in the media, coming and hitting you right away. And you can see that this explosion of immorality. Yes, there's two men talking here, right? But we have sisters. Yes, these two men have sisters. These two men have, we have wife and, and daughters, daughters, right? We have wife yes, and we have daughters wife. And, a, and a son. And we're seeing it. We're seeing it. So I want to just say again, the, the perspective of mainstream media in 1930 is very different from any media today. And the perspective of the, of the, the Protestant reformers is really different. I wanna talk now about contraception and immorality because that's the conversation that this has teed up. And I wanna say when I first read these quotes, I was perplexed. I, I, I looked at them over and over and said, but how you could jump to those conclusions? But then over a hundred years ago, the Protestant reformer saw, saw contraception had the power to corrupt civilization, to pervert the natural order, to transform it into humans who oppose God's intention. Wow. A hundred years ago and 500 years ago, the Protestant reformers agreed with St. Paul VI. I seen it, you know. Because it's St. Paul VI, who 50 something years ago, 53 or four years ago, said with contraception, no, I can't give way to that. The committee's report was had proposed to him mm -hmm. that yeah. he, should, he, should, he should allow contraception within marriage as, as not a sin. And, and he agonized and agonized and eventually said no. I can't, I can't do it. Now, what I'm saying is the Protestant reformers and the media of a hundred years ago agreed with them. Today, we still in Calcutta because of that decision. Mm -hmm. And what I, would, what I would say is 50 years on, many are now writing that St. Paul VI was a prophet. Everything he said, he made four predictions of what would happen, and all four predictions have come true. And, and, and that in itself is something that we can see. But I want to make some real subtle, subtle comments here. You see, sometimes what seems difficult on the level of the human being and of the married couple and we give them a blight, we don't understand how it impacts the level of civilization. Right. And, and, and St. Paul VI was looking at the level of civilization, understanding how tough it was for married couples to hear the teaching. He understood how tough it was. That's why he agonized. But from, on the level of civilization, he understood to give way into a contraceptive mentality will undo civilization as we know it. And well, you know, we have to say St. Paul VI was right. We have to say the Washington Post was right in the 1930s. Calvin, Luther, Wesley were all right.
you know, I, I, I just, I just feel that this message, this message has to get outside here. And I feel, I, I don't want us to limit, somehow I feel like we're limiting this, this, this news that, that, that is so explosive that we shouldn't limit this. So people, you're watching Shepherd's Corner. This is conversation with Archbishop G. Let's get this message outside to everybody that you know, because it is true. And if we keep going down this same road, I do not know where we will end up. That's my feeling. So let me give you a quick recap now. The very strong condemnations from an era past, hear them, sodomy, murder to future generations, unnatural, destructive to the soul, homosexual sodomy, a death knell of marriage as a holy institution, degrading practices, indiscriminate immorality. This is what voices from a generation before us were saying about contraception. Okay? We had a look now. We've had it now for 50-something years, readily available. And the promise was, if contraception became more readily available, abortion will drop. There are no way you get more contraception available in America. You could get it any, everywhere for free if necessary. And, and it hasn't dropped the abortion rate. No, it hasn't. And, 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 and I'm coming to that after. I'm, I'm coming to that after. You see, if we are to strive for objectivity, we have to say that legalizing contraception has, in fact, brought about all the predictions and consequences. Marriage in America has a 50% chance of lasting. Homosexual marriage is now legal. The sexual revolution has sexualized the entire culture. And our children are bumping into pornography at around nine years old. Our children, you know, and grandchildren, the average age of a child bumping into pornography is somewhere around nine right now. Between seven and 11 is what I get from kids. Okay? And, and that should not be. Yeah. That just should not be. But, but how did we get here? How did we get here? When a child bumps into pornography at nine years old, they're preteen, which means that their body can't even tell them what it is they're really seeing. But there's just such great energy and excitement that the curiosity drives them. And so they don't even know in their body what it is they're actually seeing. And what happens then is this trauma sexualizes the child into addictive patterns in their teen years. And what's the real drama? It creates these challenges for intimacy in their later years. There are many, many marriages right now that are dissolving because of pornography addiction. And what he wants from her or what she wants from him is not normal. Yeah. Yeah. Because I, I, after you have, you have viewed the, the erotic, you keep upping the ante constantly. And you come into marriage now and no flesh and blood human being could actually deliver what your pornography has been, been simulating you with. Now you have a problem. John, you have a big problem. Now you have the problem. But you understand how the connection mm -hmm. between, between the, the, the contraception and, and the sexual immorality that we now have. I'm sure there are other factors like technology that has driven it. Eh? But the concubiscence came while when we separated the, the unitive from the procreative. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In view of this sexual revolution and its consequences, we have now to look at the impact of contraception on our civilization, 50 something years on. Eh? Many now see St. Paul the VI as a, as a prophet. He, like the early reformers, saw the disastrous impact of contraception on civilization. And there's still Catholic teachers, theologians who disagree with St. Paul VI. 
but his teaching was clear and it has been consistent. The teaching of the encyclical Humanae Vitae presented a challenge to pastors and particular married couples in the rapidly transforming Western culture of the last 50 years, living the teaching of the encyclical was a very significant yeah. challenge for married couples. Yeah. And I have journeyed with many, many, many married couples who absolutely struggled with this one area of the church's teaching yeah. and struggled, struggled, struggled deeply with it. But on the level of civilization, we have to be honest and we have to say that the destruction to the civilization has been enormous. The predictions of the reformers and St. Paul VI have been far too accurate for us to ignore it or for us to say, nah, man, that was just talking stupidness. I, I will to say here, boy, that. Um... Pope, for Paul VI, um, he saw so far in the future, if we went down this rabbit hole, that what we are seeing right now in Western civilization, because there's Western civilization that pushed this, eh, yes. is that the demographics, if you are a student of demography, you will see that, wait a minute, we are having less and less children. We are reaching to the stage where our civilizations are on. Uh, unsustainable. Correct. Once you drop below 1.8, and, and ours is now 1.6. Yeah. And Europeans are now 1.1 and 1.3. Correct. Correct. So it, I, the consequences on civilization is what I'm looking at. You know, I really sympathize with every married couple. I sympathize because it, it is a difficult one, um, especially because of the civilization in which we're living and because of the thinking of the civilization, it makes it a more difficult choice and a more conscious choice that is required. But hear what? I've met young couples who got into the, the, the rhythm method in its new incarnations. They have apps for it. They have billing, they have billing, billing, billing. They have, don't, yeah. don't say rhythm method. They'll kill you for that. Well, well, um, well it, it's, it's not even billings anymore. It's billings and yeah. um, others that are using apps and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and different things that has taken what was rudimentary and brought it into a science, brought it into a lifestyle, brought it into a communication between husband and wife, brought it into a relationship that forms between husband and wife. And it is, it is so much better than using artificial means of contraception, mm -hmm. you know, because here you have a discussion, you know, you, you, you have a discussion, you know, can we wait? You know, and that's an amazing, amazing yeah. gift. It's fasting, you know, and in yes. fasting, we are strengthened by this fasting. Listen, right. and yet the culture says, why oh. must you fast? You have an itch, scratch, you know? And then if your wife wants to say, well, no, you know, because this is what's going to happen, guess what? You go into your pornography, you go into your deputy essential, you go to, and all these other things. But that is the backdrop of the culture. Of course. Sexual, sexualization that has come. But let's go a little further on here. It's in John Paul II writing about the connection between contraception and abortion says, despite their differences of nature and moral gravity, contraception and abortion are often closely connected wow. as fruits of the same tree. Fruits of this. So this is where you're getting the fruits of the same tree from. Direct quote from St. Pope John Paul II. Wow. Despite contraception and abortion yeah. are often closely connected as fruits of the same tree. I tell you, there's a big one. Eh? In his 1981 encyclical, Pope John Paul wrote Familiar's Consortio. 
he reaffirmed the teaching of St. Paul VI. He reiterated that any separation of the unitive from the procreative diminishes dimensions of the conjugal love is a grave error. Wow. So the unitive is the bringing of the two bodies together. Mm -hmm. The procreative is that act being open to life. What he says is any separation is a grave error. Why? It transforms a couple into an arbitrator rather than a minister regarding the couple's power to transmit human life. Theology of the body. Theology of the body. 101. Theology of the Transforms body. a couple into an arbitrator as opposed to a minister. And that's big, because the couple remember, yes. minister the sacrament to each yes. other. Yes. Couple are the first ministers of the sacrament. And, and the sacrament is all about the two becoming one yeah. and, and that oneness producing life. The ministers are the ones who are, who are conduits of, of that creative energy of God coming into the world through the unitive act, through procreation. Now, if you, if you want to separate the unitive from the, from the procreative, He's saying, well, you become an arbit arbitrator, not a minister anymore. Not a minister anymore. There's a historical connection between contraception and abortion, which Dr. William Newton invites readers to explore. He wrote an article, Contraception and Abort Abortion, Fruits of the Same Rotten Tree. That's it. That's it. No, 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 no. Dr. William Newton, I got it. Yeah, <laughs> fruits of the same rotten tree. No, my own is rotten fruits of the same tree. <laughs> Here's what he says. The anti-life atmosphere excluded by contraception mm -hmm. goes a long way to explain why countries that permitted contraception very quickly followed up with laws permitting large-scale abortion. Wow. There was just eight years separating the legalization of contraception and abortion in America, seven years in Britain, eight years in France. Ireland held out the longest with 35 years from, from 1978 to 2013. And he continues, I suspect this is a record, but perhaps has something to do with the fact that Irish women could abort their babies in Great Britain. Cross the border. Cross the border. Now, I want you to hear how this works, eh? That he's saying that when a country legalizes contraception, the next thing it does, it legalizes abortion. And, and, and that, so in America, 1965 contraception, 1973 abortion. abortion. Yeah. Britain, 1961 contraception, 1968 abortion. France, 1967 contraception, 1975 abortion. I want you to see how legalizing one leads to legalizing the other. And that's why I'm, 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 I'm asking or answering the question, how did we get to be so ambivalent about the baby in the womb and to, to really see the baby in the womb as a, a woman's issue and not as a human issue or as a life issue that involves every single one of us. You know, life, the church has always taught, is a seamless garment. And when you cut at that garment anywhere, you weaken the fabric, fabric of the whole garment. And whether you start with contraception, abortion, or euthanasia, you have weakened the garment once you cut the garment at any point. But they, 
the rapid movement from legalizing contraception to legalizing abortion demonstrates in the Western world the interconnection between these two. Seven and eight years generally is, is the time frame between the, between the two things. Then we have the, 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 cold, the cold sexual revolution, the cold sexual revolution and how this thing took hold. I, I mean, I'm, I'm just thinking about the countries that have gone down this route and what we are seeing today. You know, we're talking about the sanctity of marriage. That's one of the things that we spoke yeah. about earlier. Yeah. Totally destroyed, you know. We're talking about one in yeah. every two marriages is, is dead. Go on. Go on. You know, and the other, the other half struggling, you know. Hello. So one in two dead and half of the of the of the one yeah. is in, in deep struggle. Yeah. Here's this. Contraception and abortion, they are symbiotic pair. They feed on each other. And their child, their child wow. is the sexual immorality that has become rampant in Western civilization as we know it. That's my song by for the night. That's a big song by boy, because that, that song by resonating. I tell you, that song by is resonating. This is why I want everybody to watch this show. This was real big. You know, I, I couldn't even buckle up enough because we see it. Parachute, we para, I tell you, parachute tonight. Or listen, no? listen, listen. You see, I know that you meet a, a lot with couples, and so do I. I meet with couples every Tuesday and Thursday, and, and I'm seeing this fallout. It's a big fallout. Couples that are only married six months, six months. Then something else. That's why I'm saying contraception and abortion are symbiotic pair. They feed off of each other. They, they, they work off of each other. They work off of each other. They follow each other. And, and, and the fruit of them is the sexual revolution and the drop in the birth rate which has now dropped below sustainable thresholds in most of the Western countries in the world, including Trinidad and Tobago, Barbados, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. That, that's, that's, what we, that's what we're really dealing with. You see, when the unitive and the procreative were tightly tied together, mm -hmm. People had to show great restraint. And yes, right through civilization, people have tried to find their ways around it and, and did different things that were less or more effective. But when, when you completely, completely disconnect the unitive act from the, from the procreative act, then teenagers having sex, as a matter of course, good ones, Catholic ones, Hindu, Muslim ones, as a matter of course, means that the bomb of this, this war on the conscience of humanity has already had its, its, its impact on the minds of our young people. It has already ha had its impact on their minds. And, and that, that is what why we are so desensitized around abortion it starts with becoming desensitized around contraception around sexual morality around what god called us to live it all of these things we have to we have to hold together we can't we can't separate these things out everything that modern western culture is proud of in terms of the reproductive white rights of women is against what the ancients considered good moral practice. Isn't that weird? Yeah, that's weird. Wow. No, and we have to ask ourselves, is it that the ancients were uninformed or is it that we have bought a bag of tricks that, that really is not about what human nature is? And, and here is next one, buckle up again. St. Ignatius named the devil as the 
enemy of human nature. The enemy of human nature. So, so watch it. You separate yeah. the, the, the unitive from the procreative. Huh? Yeah, yeah. Now we're separating sex from gender. Wow. Okay? Which is exactly what the reformers saw in 1500. Yes. That is going to go to sodomy. How? Do ask me. I, I, I'm missing pieces in the logic chain. But they saw that. But now that we are separated, the, the unity from the procreative, we are separating sex from gender. And now you could be anything you want to be. What you were born and who you are really don't make no difference. You understand how desensitized we are. And you understand why Ignatius says the devil is the enemy of human nature. Everything that makes us human is being turned on itself. Male and female, he made them. Well, we know where that one went. Man and woman for marriage, we know where that one went. That the, the man and the woman must cling to each other and become one flesh. And that one flesh is not just an act. It is a lifelong process of unification until death do us part. We know where that one went. Everything that is good for the human being surrounding human sexuality and reproduction has been turned on its head and turned into its opposite. We have to say we have had the greatest number pulled on us and we don't even see it. And what we think is freedom and liberty is actually license and degrading of the human being. All that I could think of while you were saying this is Lucifer, because we're talking about Saint Ignatius, eh? name yeah. the devil as the enemy of human nature. All I can think of is him saying, Did God really say if you eat of the fruit in the middle of the garden, you will surely die? That was Did God that really was... say that he made you on male and female. Uh, hello, did God really say that you should wait until marriage? Did God really say that you can't have sex when you want, how you want, and with who you want? All of that the enemy of human nature. If, if all of that is true, then I will say to you, contraception and abortion have been the Say that again. If all that we just said is true, contraception and abortion have been major weapons in the arsenal of the devil. Yes. I want to say that in one hand, but on the next hand, I want to say, and, and next week, I want to deal with that. But whatever we have done and wherever we have gone, God calls us to God is love and mercy. So this is not about shame. This is not about shame. This is not about making anybody feel bad. Return to God, confess wherever it is went wrong, and, and let's experience the mercy and the love of our God. I, I, and I, I love how you just brought that in because, you know, so many people watching on would say, but wow, what have I done? But that's God, God in his love and his mercy. Reaches you right where you are. Amen. Amen. Right where you are. Right where you are. Whatever you've done that is wrong. Whatever you've done that has broken God's commandments. Whatever you've done that has, has been wrong in, in, and, and distorted human nature. God is love and mercy. Remember my definition of mercy. Mercy is what the lover does when the beloved messes up. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's what God does. Mercy. Mercy. I would say there's so many things that have progressed in the modern world over the last 56 years. Huh? So many things that we could count on. Technology, electricity, um, the use of, of communication tools, um, the way we, we run our businesses, our transportation, movement from, from city to cities, movement across the globe. There's so many things that, that we've progressed in as a, as a people over the last 50 to 60 years. I think we have more opportunities than any generation that has ever lived before us in doing all kinds of amazing things that they could never have even thought of doing. 
Yet, we still cannot see that abortion is killing a human life. Wow. We just can't see it. That abortion is killing a human life. We just, we just not right now wanting to see it. We are still seeing the fetus as a part of the woman's body. It is an individual with his own DNA made up in, its, in the uniqueness of God. And that's what we have to see. We have to see that. But to see that, we have to understand the cloud in which we have been living and how that cloud has done a number on us and, and, and desensitize us from what we have believed in generations past to what we have accepted willy-nilly in the last 50, 60 years. We have to start seeing that contraception is a slippery slope to corrupt the whole of the civilization. You know, I, and, and you know, you, you hear so much about women's rights and your right to choose and that kind of thing. And this, I was just watching this, this, this kind of, I don't know if the, the word idolatry is the right word to use. It's a it. good word. It's a good word because it's an idea system. It's a whole idea system that, that doesn't, doesn't hold to reality. We cannot see that what may look reasonable on the human level may well spell disaster on the level of civilization. And that's the main point, you know, on the human level, man, I get it, you know. Yeah, yeah. I absolutely have struggled with enough couples who, who have had children while practicing um, billings and, and, and really struggling hard. So I, I get that one. But, but what we're not seeing is, is what, what the, on the level of civilization, what we're really dealing with. And the way it's corrupted us on the level of civilization. So here's my key message. Contraception and abortion are tied together. They are symbiotic pair. They're the fruit of the same tree. The first lays the foundation for laxity in morals and a sexual, sexualized culture. The latter disseminates or desensitizes the human to our true dignity. And therefore, we dehumanize the human. Dehumanize the human. Wow. Give me action step. Give me action step. Tonight was, tonight was plenty. Reflect on your belief about contraception and abortion. And then read the Catechism of the Catholic Church on both contraception and abortion. Just go and you'll find it in the index. Go and look it up. Yeah. Scripture reading. The scripture reading. 1 John 2, 15 to 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, love for the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. Well, you know you're going to have to pray with us tonight because this was one big, big one. We need Father, a we, we thank you, Father, for your tremendous love. And we know, we know oh God, that we, we rarely have fallen short of your glory. We've done what is wrong. We, we know that we've not lived up to your high ideal. We know, oh God, that, you know, we, we live in a time where what we see and your law is so, so different. And we pray, oh God, to just, just help us to, to look through the blinders, pull apart the, 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 the fabric that stops our sight and help us to see the truth in this matter of contraception, abortion, sexual morality, and, and, and human dignity and human life. And we pray, oh God, that out of your goodness, give us the courage to see, 
to comprehend, to believe, to act, and to live for your glory. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Archbishop J, for a wonderful, wonderful conversation. Rotten fruits of the same tree. Watch it. You may need to watch it again. God bless you and have a good night. And hey, remember what's coming. Remember what's coming. All right. God bless you.